Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. You guys like it when I cover airliners, even though many people are like, Simon, these aren't Mega Projects. To which I always say, well, you build the first passenger airliner and tell me it's not. Let's get into it. But before we do, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's a holiday project or a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their wonderful all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. This was a passenger airliner that changed the world, but also one that has fallen through the cracks of history. The story of the de Havilland Comet is one of both cutting-edge technology that revolutionized aviation and also tragic disaster. The world's first passenger jet airliner, which made its first flight on the 27th of July 1949, understandably caused a bit of a stir. At the time, traditional passenger aircraft were powered by propellers and were hardly the luxury air travel that we've become accustomed to. <laughs> not if you're in coach. <laughs> Incredibly noisy, with the kind of vibrations that could shake out one's fillings, long-haul travel in one of these aircraft was a testing experience. But that all began to change with the appearance of the de Havilland Comet. To begin with, it looked like something out of a space age, a sleek design with swept back wings and four jet engines that were never seen before on a commercial airliner. Today it looks remarkably similar to our modern planes, but in the early 1950s it might as well have come from outer space. The new modern way to travel by air arrived and the comet was surely going to take the world by storm. But that's not how things turned out. A series of fatal accidents proved that this aircraft was perhaps a little ahead of its time, and despite rallying with a newer, safer design, the aircraft was never able to recapture the same excitement or trust. World War II had not even finished when the British government began pondering plans for the future of their aviation industry. There was general dissatisfaction that before the war, the American twin-engine Douglas DC-3 was the aircraft of choice for a huge 90% of the world's airline passengers. In terms of aviation, the Americans had sprinted ahead, and the British didn't like that one bit. Oh no, they didn't. Something was needed. Something rather drastic. While the first military jets had appeared out of Germany in 1939, a jet passenger airliner was an entirely different proposition. At the time, the general assumption was that jets were too unreliable and used too much fuel to be used in this way. Sir Geoffrey de Havilland, who was both part of the committee brought together in Britain to discuss the aviation industry and head of the de Havilland Company and aircraft manufacturer, well, he believed otherwise. It's difficult not to overstate the complexities of the design that was first envisioned. What was initially put forward was not a passenger airliner, but a transatlantic mail plane with just six passenger seats on board. But it would need to have a cruising altitude of 12,192 meters, that's 40,000 feet, and a cruising speed of 640 kilometers an hour, that's 400 miles per hour. Now, that might not sound particularly mind-blowing in 2020, but this was the late 1940s, and it was nothing short of revolutionary. Nothing like this with jet engines had ever been attempted, and in truth, most people were just convinced that it wasn't possible. In December 1945, the British Overseas Airways Corporation BOAC, accepted the proposal from de Havilland and initially set out an order for 25 aircraft, which was soon reduced down to 10. Over the next year, final alterations were made with the passenger capacity expanded to 24 and then to 36, while the more powerful Halford H2 Ghost 50 turbojet engines replaced the Halford H1 Goblin, which had been included in initial designs. These alterations were final in December 1947, with the new design being known as the DH-106 Comet. The fact that this was very much an experimental aircraft meant that testing was both vigorous and a top priority. Countless stress tests were done on the fuselage in both pressurized and non-pressurized environments. Everything on board the plane needed to be carefully examined under the kind of pressure it would eventually face in the air. Windows, doors, and everything down to the smallest components was painstakingly scrutinized. The first prototype was assembled in 1949, and during the first half of the year, it went through further ground testing. But by July the 27th, the time had come to see whether this next generation aircraft could really fly. Piloting the aircraft that day was John Cunningham, a renowned night pilot from World War II who had earned the nickname Cat's Eyes, along with four other members of his crew. 
The flight lasted 31 minutes and was deemed a great success. Later that year, it even appeared on the grounds of the Farnborough Air Show, a sure sign of growing confidence. A year later, a second prototype was completed, and it too began air testing. It would appear that all was progressing smoothly, and word began to spread of the comet's early successes. Now, before I get to the design of the comet, I do want to take a very quick moment to thank today's video sponsor, Squarespace. Believe it or not, we're not terribly far away from the holidays and the new year. It does seem to roll around quickly every time. So whatever that thing you're thinking about doing is, well, the time to do it is now. And it's with Squarespace. Squarespace is the platform to use if you want to get started on a new web project. Are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Bam! Squarespace. Use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you like it's right out of the box. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person and you have lots of opinions and ideas about exactly what your site should look like. Well, Squarespace gives you all of the customization options that you could ever want, with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing with the colors, whatever, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides you so that your website can thrive. Mailing lists, social integrations, analytics, commercial options, 24 7 customer support it's everything you could ever want in one place and look i'm also a squarespace customer myself when i launched the website for this very channel you're watching earlier this year i went to squarespace and i used their platform to create a super functional elegant great looking website that you can find at megaprojects.net it was very easy so when you're ready to get started on your next big project, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to it. As I mentioned earlier in the video, nothing quite like the Comet had ever been seen. This was an all-metal monoplane, complete with swept wings, meaning they point further back than straight across, and two pairs of jet engines incorporated into the wings with roughly 5,000 pound force of thrust each. To put that number in perspective, a modern 747 carries engines producing between 46,300 and 56,900 pound force of thrust each. The interior was considerably more spacious than what we often see today. The cabin space was divided into first and second class, with the seats in first class arranged around tables, a bit like on a train. Those in second had to live with what we would consider normal aircraft seating, but even here it was a far cry from the often cramped conditions on board modern airliners. The flight deck layout was based on the Lockheed Constellation, which was a popular aircraft at the time, with the reasoning being that it would add an air of familiarity to the pilots. The Comet came with four hydraulic systems powered from all four engines, two primaries, one secondary, and one in case of an emergency, which could still control basic functions such as lowering the landing gear, although this could also be done manually using a hand pump. The aircraft also came with a new pressurized fueling system which had recently been developed by Flight Refueling Limited in the UK, which allowed the fuel tanks to be filled at a much faster rate than other aircraft. Much of the early fascination with the Comet was down to its sleek fuselage. No passenger aircraft had ever been built to fly as high and as fast as the Comet, so the fuselage was something of an experiment. The thin metal skin was constructed with a combination of alloys which were riveted and then chemically bonded to save weight. The bonding process was done using a new adhesive called Redux, which had only been developed in the 1940s. The first comet that appeared measured 28 meters in length and had a wingspan of 35 meters, making it fairly small compared to modern jumbo jets. As I'll come to later in the video, there were subsequent comets which gradually grew in size. On the 2nd of May 1952, the fifth production aircraft off the assembly line waited patiently on the runway at London Heathrow Airport. It was a misty spring morning in Britain, and the crowd, who had gathered to witness this historic flight, heard the comet before they saw it. A loud shriek boomed out across the airport as the aircraft's engines kicked into gear, and moments later the comet appeared out of the mist, hurtling down the runway. Those watching held their breath as the nose slowly lifted into the sky. For the first time in history, fare-paying passengers were aboard a commercial passenger jet which was now headed for Johannesburg in South Africa. And what a start to life 
the aircraft made. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and Princess Margaret were given a special flight on board in 1953, and in its first year alone it carried 30,000 passengers. While it certainly doesn't compare to our modern jet airliners, the Comet was about twice as fast as conventional propeller aircraft at the time. Not only that, it flew considerably higher, meaning it could climb above the weather rather than having to barrel through it as had become the norm. The stage was set for success, and by the summer of 1953, eight BOAC Comets left London every week, three to Johannesburg, two to Tokyo, two to Singapore, and one to Colombo. Orders began to pour in from all over the world, especially for the impending Comet 2, which would be a slightly longer version of the Comet. Airlines from France, Brazil, the USA, Venezuela, Japan, and many other nations signed up for the future of air travel. But amid all the hype, all was not well. With all the adulation that the Comet was receiving through 1952 and 1953, it's worth pointing out that the first accident involving the aircraft came on the 26th of October 1952, when a Comet failed to get airborne while departing from Rome and skidded off the runway. Despite severe damage to the aircraft, only two passengers received minor injuries, and the accident was initially blamed on pilot error. But it happened again on the 3rd of March 1953, when a Comet attempted a night takeoff in Karachi in Pakistan. This time, things were not so fortunate, with the aircraft toppling into a dry drainage canal and colliding with an embankment. The accident killed all five crew members on board, along with six passengers. Once again, the accident was attributed to pilot error, which was only later found to be false. Hindsight is a tricky animal, and no doubt some over the subsequent years questioned whether the Comet should have continued flying after those early accidents. As it happens, they did, and a full-scale disaster was just around the corner. On the 2nd of May, BOAC Flight 783 climbed into the sky above Calcutta on its way to London. Almost immediately, the aircraft ran into a powerful thunderstorm, and just six minutes after takeoff, it began to disintegrate in midair. Eyewitnesses reported seeing the Comet plunge wingless down to Earth. The crash killed all 43 on board, including six crew members and 37 passengers. Sadly, though, this was just the start. Just over a year later, and again departing from Rome, the site of the first accident involving a comet, the first production aircraft produced crashed into the Mediterranean 20 minutes after takeoff, killing all 35 on board. With no eyewitnesses and only a partial radio transmission received, the cause of the crash was not immediately clear. The investigation into the second crash it took some time, with the Royal Navy attempting to salvage the wreckage. In the meantime, BOAC grounded their comet fleet as a committee began looking into the crash. Quite astonishingly, no fault was found with the aircraft after either of their recent fatal crashes. This has since led some to question whether the prestigious British project received a degree of protection from the government. There seems to be little to no evidence of this, but as we shall see, it didn't take long for this decision to backfire spectacularly. On the 23rd of March 1954, BOAC's comet once again took to the skies, but it wasn't for long. Just over two weeks later, a comet operated by South African Airways was traveling from Rome to Cairo, and it crashed off the coast of Naples, killing all 21 on board. The comet was once again grounded, and its certificate of airworthiness was eventually revoked. This time, investigators had to get to the bottom of the causes of the crashes. A dedicated water tank was constructed in the UK, in which a comet airframe was placed. Here, the fuselage underwent countless repressurization and overpressurization tests to see how well it would cope, and for a while, everything seemed to be going fine. On June 24, 1954, the test fuselage split open, originating from a bolt hole. It was quickly discovered that the fuselage did not have enough strength to prevent the crack from growing. Investigators summarized that a split could occur anywhere between 1,000 and 9,000 cycles, one cycle being one takeoff and one landing. The aircraft involved in the first major crash in the Mediterranean had completed 1,290 cycles. They also found that the way the windows had been installed was a recipe for disaster, with the punch riveting method not strong enough to prevent fatigue cracks from spreading around these points. Punch riveting, in which the hole is punched out by the rivet itself, may have sped up the process, but the holes created were imperfect and contributed to the overall weaknesses within the aircraft. The findings of the investigation had been damning, but they would not be terminal. All Comet 1s were immediately withdrawn from service, and a major rethink took place on how to strengthen the aircraft. It may have taken a few years, but eventually de Havilland felt they'd got it right. This involved thicker alloy skin, a complete redesign and strengthening of the windows, and thicker gauge materials used in the pressurized cabin area. The Comet 2 was slightly larger and had flown for the first time on the 27th of August 1953 and was also withdrawn and completely rebuilt, while the Comet 3 was very 
very much a development aircraft and was never mass manufactured. Comet 4, on the other hand, would become the most successful aircraft in the series. It measured 5.64 meters longer than the Comet 1 and could typically seat between 74 and 81 passengers. By 1958, deliveries of the Comet 4 were going out around the world at a cost of 1.14 million pounds each. That's 24 million pounds today. There was also a change in the engines, with the Rolls-Royce Avon Mark 524 turbojet being added, boosting the power output to 10,500 pound force of thrust per engine. It's fairly astonishing that despite the catalogue of disaster, not only was the aircraft able to return, it came back bigger than ever. But the Americans had caught up, and while the Comet had made a return, it would struggle. By the end of the 1950s, American passenger airliners, which included the Boeing 707 and the Douglas DC-8, were bigger, faster, and more cost-effective. The Comet was unable to keep up, and BOAC ceased flights using the Comet 4 in 1965, but around the world they flew until 1981. As I mentioned right at the beginning of this video, the name de Havilland Comet has somewhat fallen through the cracks when it comes to aviation history. While Boeing and Douglas have gone on to become household names, de Havilland has not. The reasons for this are pretty obvious. The disastrous series of fatal accidents that occurred during the 1950s should have been enough to finish off the company. The fact that it came back was almost unbelievable. But let's set those disasters aside for the time being. The de Havilland Comet was a truly extraordinary breakthrough in terms of aviation technology, and it should be remembered as such. The world's first passenger jet airliner was certainly not perfect, and there are questions over whether it should have been allowed to fly after the early accidents, but make no mistake about it, aviation before and after the Comet was almost entirely different. What's interesting is that those who worked for Boeing and Douglas on their early jet airliners have since said that if structural failures hadn't happened to the Comet, they would most likely have happened with their aircraft. This was a painful rite of passage that the airline industry had to experience as they moved into the jet age. The Havilland Comet was a deeply flawed masterpiece, but one that should be remembered as the aircraft that completely changed air travel. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos three times a week. Also, if you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, use the comments below. If you would like to support Mega Projects, please do support our fantastic sponsor Squarespace. Link below. And thank you for watching.